are joined by Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor. Game 82, Chuck. Things don't go the Flyers' way. The Flyers lose. Uh, it is after, of course. It ended anyway with uh, Detroit and Shane Gostaspare tying things up with three seconds left to eliminate the Flyers by forcing overtime. Thoughts on Game 82? Yeah, I, I couldn't hear you once you started talking, so I'll just give my general feeling after the after the pressers. Honestly, I just it, it's a bummer. I feel bad for these guys. I honestly feel like, you know, and yeah, in the end, it's on them because they're the ones who went on the eight-game losing streak. And had they scored a few wins during that run, if they would have beaten Montreal once, if they would have beaten Columbus— you know, they're not in this position. They don't open the door for, you know, other teams to, to, to pass them. And maybe they're sitting third in the Metro. Maybe they're where the, the Islanders are. But you could tell I mean, the, the guys we talked to, we talked to Scott Lawton, Sean Couturier, Eric Johnson, and Sam Harrison. Coots and Lawton in particular. I mean, you could tell just how devastated they were. Um, these guys, I, I give them credit. I said this after the, uh, the Montreal game that I thought the playoffs were they, at that point out of the question. They put themselves in a position where they were toast. It was over. I just needed to see them over the final three, show they weren't quitting, prove that, and really finish the year as strong as they could. And I thought, you know, even this game, I thought they finished the year as a team about as strong as they could have. You know, this is a game where I thought they, on the whole, got the better of play. They lose on an empty net goal. You know, maybe if they're in a different situation, they win this game in overtime because they don't have to worry about pulling the goalie late in the third. I, I don't come away from this game with too many bad things to say about the Flyers. I think you can say bad things about that eight-game losing streak. You'd probably quibble with some of the decisions that John Tortorella made in this game. Uh, some guys didn't have it, I would say, as, as much as you certainly wanted them to. But as a group for me, I felt like this game and the previous two, you know, the Flyers showed that they care and they showed that, you know, this is a team that is together and it's not like they're a finished product by any means. They need a lot more talent. That is going to be the focus, hopefully, of this offseason, of next offseason, you know, basically until Mitch Goff comes over. They're, they need to find ways to get, you know, high end young talent, whether it's through draft, whether it's through trades, whether it's through developing the existing guys they have, turning guys like Tyson Forrester into stars. They got to find some way to get them. But I think as a group, these guys did about all they could in this one. It just wasn't enough. And it's a bummer, it, but it just wasn't enough. You uh, you have us now, Charlie. Can you hear me? I do. I can all hear right. you now, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with um, – I thought they were good tonight. I didn't think they had – and, like, they just – one, they don't have that high-end talent, so they don't have that one guy like a Claude Giroud to come out lay out Sidney Crosby and score the goal and say, let's fucking go. And it's over. You know, they don't have that, but I didn't think they had like that next level tonight. They just, they look good, but they didn't look desperate to me. I, that's just me, but uh, no, I, I think they finished strong and that is a good sign. Um, you mentioned some of Tortorella's decisions. They end up for the second half of the game. And really most of, most of the last two periods, Basically, just rolling three lines. Uh, what uh, Cam Atkinson? We know, like it is what it is. But Brink and Forster, uh, or Brink and Frost, Frost, excuse me, yeah, can score. They score goals sometimes. Uh, the Flyers desperately needed a couple of those. They didn't play the final thirty minutes of the game. What did you make of that? What did Torts say about it? If he addressed it? Yeah, I mean, Torts was asked about it. He had to be. Well, he actually brought it up on his own at first he said he'd shortened the bench mostly because you know he had kind of zeroed in the, on the guys who he thought were rolling and he wanted to ride them you know he, and he felt like after he started doing that the team started developing more offense they obviously had the very strong finish of the second period that was after he shortened the bench that probably convinced him to keep doing it into the third um i hit him with a follow-up question basically said you mentioned about shorting the bench was it more about what the nine guys you kept playing were doing or was it more about what the three guys you stopped playing weren't doing and he said both um look i think it's abundantly clear that 
Cam Atkinson, you know, whether he has nothing left in his NHL career or whether he just had nothing left in this season, he had nothing left. That makes perfect sense. I tweeted out he was – there was – like Frost and Brink were still in the middle of the bench. It seemed like they still thought they might get more shifts. Atkinson spent the entire third period on the far side – one spot away from the nearest guy, just opening and closing the door. I mean, he knew he wasn't getting back in that game. Even Brink, I understand. He's a rookie. He's been inconsistent. I went back and watched the tape. He had a, a pretty ugly – it ended up not really amounting to anything, but it was basically just like a, a post-entry turnover that didn't make much sense. He kind of passed the puck to no one and ended up going right out of the zone. Maybe that was the play that caught towards his eye. Frost is the one where – And, I mean, I am not the biggest Morgan Frost defender in the world. I think he was pretty darn good through the vast majority of the second half of the season, really, since January. Maybe he wasn't playing his best, but to me, he should have been in the rotation in the second half of this game. You should have found a way to get him some shifts, especially given the fact that you needed offense. I mean, Sam Erickson said it after the game, we entered this game down one goal, that that's the way we had to treat it. We were down one goal from the start of this game because I asked Harrison, I said, where are your feelings at? Like you play in this must win game, the team loses and you were on the bench when the game winning goal was scored. Like where, where's your head at? And he, that's when he said, we enter this game down one goal. So I think he was looking at it where he should have delivered a shutout that that was, that was his feeling. But if you enter a game down one goal, you need goals. You've been struggling to score goals in my mind, Morgan Frost, He's not a perfect player, but he's certainly one of your most talented offensive players. And I think he should have been in the rotation. I understand he didn't look amazing in the first half, but I don't think he looked terrible. Like, it wasn't as if he was making massive mistakes. He messed up the defensive coverage. I think he should have stayed in the rotation. In the end, it wouldn't have mattered anyway because... Even if they win this game in regulation, Detroit takes the game to overtime and the Flyers are out anyway. So in the end, I guess we're kind of talking about something that in the grand scheme of things is irrelevant. But it is relevant in one way in that one of the big stories we talked about it ad nauseum in the first half of the season was the Torts Morgan Frost relationship. It seemed like Frost had earned his way, if not into Torts' good graces, but at least out, at least out of the doghouse that in game 82 for all the marbles towards regress back into his old holding Morgan Frost to a different standard than he does to other guys. It just, it, it rubbed me the wrong way. I'm sure Morgan Frost didn't particularly care for it. Do I think it means that Morgan Frost is getting traded? No, I, I don't know how this is going to play out. I think he had a strong second half. I think Danny Breer really likes him. It's just that I didn't love that decision from John Tortorella because you need goals. And Morgan Frost is one of the guys who helps to create goals. And instead, you were rolling with, you know, Noah Cates, who I love, but he's not a he's not a scorer. I know he's been scoring recently, but like Ryan Paling gets the fourth most minutes on the uh, on the forward court. Good player. I would rather have Morgan Frost out there when you need a goal than, than Ryan Paling. But Torres just went back to went back to his old his old ways, and Morgan Frost was the the cost of that, I guess. I completely agree with that, Charlie. Hey, JP over here. I want to talk about the big moment in the first period where you had that weird, like, Joel Farabee deflection goes in that there. It gets called back. We were doing the, the live watch long, so we really couldn't hear exactly what happened, but we were in there in the building. What did you hear the, what the call was on that one? Yeah, it's hard for me to get – to me, it's just one of those plays where, I, you know, it sucks for the Flyers because – there's no reason why the, the ref should blow that play dead. That is a live puck. It is a puck that is going to drop into a very dangerous area, and maybe the Flyers score if that whistle isn't blown. But I can't get too angry about the ultimate call because once, like, that whistle was blown while that puck is in the air. You heard that whistle while the puck is still sky, still sky, skyward in the air. Once the whistle is blown, guys relax a little bit because they think, well, it must be covered. And then the puck goes, ends up going to the ground. It at least bounced off Farabee. It may have also bounced off Tom Wilson. It was kind of tough to tell from the replay. But the thing is, is that once those, once it starts bouncing off of players who have given up on the play for dead, you can't really retroactively take back the whistle. Like, 
you screwed up. You changed the entire complexion of the play and the actions of the players post-whistle by blowing the whistle. You could have probably considered it a continuation of the play had the puck just bounced on the ice and bounced in the net. But once it starts hitting players, I don't think you can, by the rules, justify calling it a goal. Look, it sucks. It sucks that the ref made that mistake. It's just it's just a bad break for the Flyers. But I don't think the call, like, the screw-up here was, was blowing the whistle. I don't think, given the circumstances, the ultimate decision made by the NHL was wrong. It's just the friggin' whistle shouldn't have been blown, and it was. And it ended up working out really poorly for the Flyers. But by the same token... If the whistle isn't blown, I don't think it's a guarantee that puck ends up in the back of the net anyway, because the guys on the ice might treat the play differently if they don't hear a whistle a half second before it ends up in guys' equipment. No, and like you even see, like Joel Farabee is not crashing the net there to try to get the rebound or something. He's just skating over because that's what you do. Like he's gliding in, and he didn't know the puck hit him until it was in the net. Like, yeah. the play sucked, but it's like nobody had any clue what was going on there, including the refs. It's his job to know, but it is what it is. Uh, down at the other end, Sam Harrison, you mentioned him earlier, Charlie. Um, I thought maybe the most encouraging thing of the way this season closed was uh, Harrison stopping 60 of the last 62 shots he faced. I mean, the one goal he allows tonight is a distant shot that somehow finds its way through two defenders and hits Ovechkin and bounces in weird as shit. It is important that Sam Harrison finished the season strong. I think he did. What did you think of his play over these last couple games and tonight? Yeah, I think he he really... I don't know if he answered any questions. He, he clearly showed that he has the mental capacity to shake off a truly horrific run and shake off what I'm sure was legitimate fatigue after getting as many games as he got. I'm sure of that. Um, John Tortorella, in his post-game press conference, it originally appeared that he was going to deliver a very short and three, four-word answers to every question type of press conference. He basically said, I don't want to answer any questions about the, the big picture of the season, which is fair. We're going to get to talk to him at exit interviews, so I get that. Um, but uh, like he wouldn't give any explanation to what he had heard on the, the disallowed goal. It seemed like it was going to be one of those pressers. But then somebody asked about Harrison. And that finally got him to open up a little bit. And he said, look, I think that's one of the, the most encouraging things about these last three games was the fact that Sam can now go into the offseason feeling good about himself because he was able to, to right the ship and really, you know, as I, I, I said a couple games ago, like I didn't think he was carrying the team. But he certainly was one of their better players over this three-game stretch. And it's worth noting, even in this game, he didn't lose them this game. He left the game with a tie. You know, he doesn't give up the game-winning goal. Maybe if they don't have to pull the goalie with a, with a score being tied, maybe he gets the win in overtime or in a shootout or whatever. And we're talking about Sam Harrison ending the year on a three-game losing streak or three-game winning streak. So Sam Harrison over the final three games did – everything you could have reasonably expected or hoped that he could do, especially given the workload he had, especially given the rut he was in. Uh, I feel more comfortable, much more comfortable now about Sam Harrison than I did two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, in terms of how I feel about him going into next year. I feel, I'm back to feeling excited about what Sam Harrison can do when he's not being run into the ground because of a really shitty situation. I'm excited to see what he can do as a tandem goalie next year, or even maybe as a 50-game starter. It's just you spread out his starts, so they're not all coming in a row. You spread them out over the course of a season rather than doing them all between the start of February and the and the middle of April. I think you get a better goalie, and I think the Flyers believe that as well. Charlie, I want to stay with these some of these young players because I, over this last stretch of the season, they have really played well. But tonight in particular, Jamie Drysdale, oh, I was telling Bill, like leading up to that one power play that we did have, I wanted to see that second power play unit because Drysdale was taking that shot. And if you really don't have a plan on power play in general, but in, in just looking in the future here, obviously Drysdale needs some development still, but I do like his possibility of quarterback in the power play for next season. Well, obviously what happens in the offseason. What do you think, Charlie? I liked his game. I thought he was skating well. I thought he was moving well. The lateral skating really popped, especially in the first half of the game. 
I don't know what Jamie Drysdale is ultimately going to become, to be honest with you. I truly don't know. I think he has the raw talent to be an impact defenseman, whether that's a number one or whether that's a, you know, a sheltered second pair guy who, you know, just feasts on easier matchups. I think he has the talent to be a guy who on a nightly basis can make an impact. He's not that guy yet. It's very clear he needs a ton of work. But I do think the tools are there for him to be a really, really good player for the Flyers. Now, this is on the coaching staff, and it's on Jamie Drysdale. It's on the coaching staff to guide him in the right direction and mold him in a way that gets the most out of his talents. And then it's on Jamie Drysdale to put the work in in the offseason, to put the work in next season, both in camp, working with Brad Shaw, and then during the season, dealing with the demanding coaching of John Tortorella, who I fully expect to be back next year. That's going to decide whether Jamie Drysdale is the impact defenseman that I believe he has the upside to be, but I don't think there's any guarantee he'll get there. He could end up just being a, a decent third-pair defenseman who shows flashes of brilliance sometimes. That could be all he ends up being. I think there's something there for him to be a lot more than that. I don't know if he's going to get there. I know that it's going to depend on the coaches, and it's going to depend on Jamie Drysdale's internal drive, and I guess we're going to see over the next you know, one, two, even three years whether he has it and whether the coaches are good enough to get it out of him. Man, when I think about Jamie Drysdale's ceiling, I watch this dude. I don't know if you've ever heard of him uh, in Detroit, Shane Gostis <laughs> Behar. Um, oh yeah, yeah, you got a that pronunciation. Couple of plays the last two nights, just high end offensive skill. Man, if the Flyers could have someone like that, and then maybe not give him away for nothing, that would be that would be really something special there, Charlie. But no, I, listen, we're gonna talk the end of this season to death. That eight game losing streak. I think like even. You put it on then because it's the timeline, like things happen, and like the most recent one is the one we think about, but like beat the fucking Sharks, you know? Don't play two of your worst games of the season against Ottawa, and you're in. Like these things happen, but we're moving on now, Chuck, um, and before we wrap up tonight's post game, we need the final edition of Charlie O'Connor's three stars of the game leading off with star number three. Yeah, star number three. I, I think I'm I thought about Sean Couture here, but I think I'm gonna go Sam Harrison. Just and it's not even just this game. It's the fact that, you know, over these three games, he was him and Travis Connect were the two biggest reasons that it got to game eighty two. That game eighty two was meaningful. And that game eighty two was meaningful really up until the end. It was meaningful really until well, I guess until Detroit scores that goal. Apparently, I asked John Tortorella this as well about, you know, did he know what was going on in the Detroit game when he pulled the goalie? He said that, yeah, he was they were keeping track of it. And that was a driving force as to why he pulled the goalie. Then immediately after he pulls the goalie, he gets told by one of it was either the video coach or one of his assistants that they just tied it. But by then the goalie's out of the net anyway. So it's like, all right, well, I, I'm not going to rush him back in, I guess, in for a penny, in for a pound. And then obviously Washington scores the game winning goal with, with Harrison out. But I think it's worth noting here that Erson should not get the loss in this game. Yes, he was the goalie of record. He was not on the ice when Washington scored the game-winning goal. So I'm not going to give any of the other stars to Flyers because they have to own the loss. The one guy who does not have to own this loss is Sam Erson. He did his job. He left the game with a score one-to-one, and... They lost this game primarily because of factors that happened long before this game happened. You know, the eight-game losing streak, all of the adversity they faced, the fact that other teams won, that other teams didn't give them the help they needed. Sam Harrison played a good enough game to get these guys to the playoffs. It's just things didn't break his way, and he ends up watching the game-winning goal score with him on the bench, not when he was in net. So for that reason, he's my third star. Let's kick it to star number two. Yeah, star number two is Alex Ovechkin. Um, I know it was a little bit of a fluky goal, but you know what? When you're the best goal scorer of all time, I know he doesn't have the record yet, but I believe he will by the end of his career. It certainly seems like he's pacing that way. I don't think anything is fluky. Guys like that just know where to go to score goals. And the Flyers, as Sam Harrison noted in his post-game press conference, they entered this game down one goal. Alex Ovechkin turned this into a two-goal game, and that meant the rest of the game the Flyers were chasing. They were chasing what functionally was a two-goal deficit. This goes back to what we've been saying all year, and I know Alex Ovechkin is past his prime, 
He's at the tail end of his career. He is an all-time great. He is a difference maker. He is the epitome of high-end talent. He is what the Flyers don't have. And in this game, the Capitals got the big goal from the guy who is the epitome of their high-end talent. That's what the Flyers need. You know, I, I'm, I certainly don't – it's really not putting the expectation that Mafe Vechkov is going to be as good as Alex Ovechkin. But – and I also don't think the Flyers necessarily need a player as good as Alexander Ovechkin. Guys like that only come around once or twice in a generation. But it does show the impact that even an aging great can have in a big game. And Alex Ovechkin showed up. He had the goal that, that his team needed. They're in the playoffs and the Flyers aren't. For that reason, Alex Ovechkin is my second star. It's just insane to look at how his season started. Eight goals through 43 games. Finishes the year with 31. Uh, that's that's an all-time great goal scorer right there to fucking find that switch. All right, let's let's close it out, Charlie. For the last time of 2023-24, star number one. Yeah, star number one. I'm going with Charlie Lindgren, and and this is not just because he had a strong game and he did. You know, he makes 27 saves on 28 shots. Very strong game. It's the fact that. He had to deal with such an enormous workload at the end of the year. He played last night. This is the second game of back to back for him. It was his third start in four nights. You know, they rode this guy. And I'm not pinning this on Arison by any means, but Arison, at least during that eight game losing streak, he wilted a little bit under the workload. I think it was an unfair workload, but he wasn't able to handle it to the degree that allowed the Flyers to make the playoffs. Certainly not all on him, but it's part of it. Charlie Lindgren. Washington ran him into the ground, too. They were using him every game during this run. Three and four to end the year. And what does back he do? Back-to-back, back back, he has a shutout, and then he gives up one goal on 28 shots. Were they all the best shots? No, they weren't. But there's a reason why goalies these days don't play back-to-backs that often. It's because it's really, really hard to be successful and to be sharp on the second game of a back-to-back. And he did it three and four, and he still played the kind of game that gave the Capitals a chance to make the playoffs. I I was never particularly familiar with Charlie Lindgren before the season, but maybe the Capitals have their answer in goal because when the you know, when when the, when the chips were down, when the the light shone brightest, he stepped up. He got the job done. For that reason, he's my first star in this final three star selection of the 2023-2024 Philadelphia Flyers season. Well, Charlie, you have done it. We have survived another year of Flyers hockey, and now it's the offseason where the real work begins. So I'm looking forward to talking to you tomorrow at 3 o'clock. We'll be right back here. That is Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor, coming to us live yeah, from and, game, and, eight, game 82. And can I, I just want to say something before I before I sign off. I um, want to thank all the uh, the viewers and listeners and readers Uh at PHLY, you know, who've been paying attention to us from the start, we obviously are building something new here this year. And uh, you know, I, I moved from uh, from a different publication, you know, build it as well. Move from not only a different publication, but also a different you know place where you could hear him. And uh, and I really really appreciate uh, all the listeners, all the people that have come on board, all the people that that followed us, all the new listeners, all the new viewers, all the new readers. I really hope you enjoyed this coverage this year. We were getting used to something new, and we did the best we could. We learned a lot. I think next year will be even better, hopefully for the Flyers, but also for us as well. I think our coverage is only going to get you know, more comprehensive, uh, just better all around. But I, I'm really, really happy with how this year went. Obviously, it would have been great to be covering the Flyers in the playoffs over the next couple of weeks. But... I think the Flyers will get there, and and I'm excited to have everybody on board, you know, with us as we cover it when they do. So just a, just a shout out to uh, to everyone watching this pod, uh, watching the live stream, just uh, really appreciate it, and uh, I'll be uh, joining the show tomorrow. We can talk a little bit more about it. And Charlie, like I appreciate all of our listeners. Very happy uh, to be doing this with you this first season. It's been a great year for us. What kind of bullshit is it that after all these years together, the breakout star is this fucking guy? <laughs> like, really? He's going to be the star of the Anthony Gargano show while we toil away here covering this goddamn 
fucking hockey team that never wins anything. Oh my god, up and no, up. It's, it's been awesome uh, getting to have everyone involved. Uh, JP joining the crew has been awesome as well. But I'll talk to you tomorrow, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. All right. Yeah, and, and also a shout out to our great producer, British. She's yeah. Done an amazing job. Absolutely, may has made the uh, look and feel of the show much better uh, since joining the team. That is Charlie O'Connor from the Wells Fargo Center. We all silly like the mayor. 